First Tim on page 553 and Are We Yet Alive, page 553. Affirmation of faith this morning is an affirmation of faith of the United Church of Canada and is found in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mountain Zion United Methodist Church this morning. Thanks to those of you attending with us here in person and to those attending virtually as well. Welcome to all of you. Do we have any first time guests with us this morning? If so, please raise your hand. So any first timers? Let me direct your attention to the flowers. The flowers are to the glory of God and in memory of Annie May and John Scoggins, placed with love from Jane Scoggins. Thank you very much for the flowers this morning. Any announcements? Susan? Uh, this Tuesday is our next uh, Midwest Food Bank pickup and um, distribution of food to our, our families. If you haven't volunteered before and you want to come join us, please do. We're always welcome to come. We always um, would love to have new people come join us. We start at about 9.30, 10 o'clock, and we usually are done by 1.30, 2 o'clock at the latest. So come join us if you can. That's this Tuesday, 9.30 to about 1.30 or so. Please see Susan if you'd like to sign up to volunteer to help distribute food. Or just come. Or just come. <laughs> Harold? Breakfast next Sunday morning at 8.30. Please come out for that. At men's club and many where as well, or UMW. Wayne? It's getting about time of the year. Next, next Sunday we're going to have a meeting for the barbecue. Next Sunday after church in the Brian uh, place. It won't be a short meeting. And, you know, as you know, it's always fun and fellowship the barbecue. Fun, fellowship, and a little war. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. The barbecue is fast approaching. It's on October 14th and 15th, so please make sure that's on your calendar. And then next Sunday, right after church, the barbecue committee will meet uh, for a brief meeting. So uh, family fun and a little bit of work is what I heard. So on the 14th and 15th. Fellowship was in there, too, I think. Lay Leadership Summit next Saturday, or this coming Saturday? Yes. All right, this coming Saturday, so please reach out to Matt if you're interested in attending that. It is a virtual event for a, two hours, was that? Yes, yeah. 10, to, 10 to noon. 10 to 12. Coming Saturday. Very good. Thanks, Matt. Other announcements? Jeff? Please don't forget that we have an informational meeting Tuesday night here at the church in the Fellowship Hall on the status of and future of the United Methodist Church and options that we and other churches may have uh, if we decide that we not want to stay with the United Methodist Church. It's not going to be uh, televised, so please, please do everything you can to be here. If you need to take Uber, please do so. If you need to call one of us to come pick you up, please do so. This is the only meeting that we're going to have to discuss this. And uh, then in the upcoming weeks, uh, there will be a called conference, church conference, by our district superintendent to take a vote if it's necessary. So again, please do everything you can to be in attendance Tuesday night at 7 in the Fellowship Hall. I can't stress the importance of that meeting enough. That's Tuesday night at 7 o'clock across the street in the Fellowship Hall, uh, an informational meeting about the future of Mount Zion. So please come out for that. Uh, and that is in person, no, no virtual option there. So please reach out to someone if you need some assistance getting here. Uh, but Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. 
Any others? There are a couple in the bulletin that I'll bring attention to. We have uh, a choir directing Hootenanny on Sunday, <laughs> September 18th. I'm not sure if that's a, uh, is that a, the official term for that? Okay, <laughs> September 18th, so please come out for that. And then Homecoming and Revival on uh, September 25th, 26th, and 27th. And there's a, uh, those start at 7 o'clock, but there's a, uh, spaghetti dinner on Tuesday at 6, so that's the 25th, 26th, and 27th for homecoming. Put that on your calendar. So the young people don't understand what a is. It's a throwdown. Okay. <laughs> Hootenanny <laughs> slash throwdown. Looking forward to that on September 18th. Any other announcements? That's, I don't... That's, yeah. All right. Any... Praises or prayer concerns this morning? I have a praise for Brian Adams. He now has a job at the Chick-fil-A Dwarf House in Hateful, which that's wonderful, but the most important thing is he can now be here on Sundays. Amen. Congratulations. Praise for that, Brian. Yes, sir. Bill? Uh, prayer concerns for Brent Cunningham. Brent Cunningham. Diane. Alan Hudson and Richard Little. Alan Hudson and Richard Little. The Histon family. The Histon family. And Brenda Flynn. Brenda Flynn. John Fisk. John Fisk. Mita. Oh, Marsha. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Prayer for DJ and uh, praise for Marsha and Steve. Mita. Yes, ma'am. Big decision for me to we'll put you on the prayer list and all the employees at Atlanta Medical Center. Yeah. Stephanie? Robert and Lily Hicks. Matt? Jay Bauman? Yes. Kathy Jones? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Regina Orr. Jefferson Brown and the Brown family. Jefferson Brown and the Brown family. Marsha. Yes, ma'am. Praise for great life, 94 years old, but be in prayer for the Homer family. Grant? Walter Up Church. Any others? Donna? Are these, Donna, are these yours? I missed them. You may get them. Or you want, all right. <laughs> Seda Hawkins, Stephen Mudd, Allen, and Julie Brown. Yes, ma'am. Sorry about that. Thank you. Brian? Jamerson family. If there are no more, we'll take these to the Lord in prayer. Lord of the cross, you call us to follow you. We mouth a yes and not an okay, but we do know what you've asked us to do, right? We're here to love you more than others. Some say the cross is too heavy to bear. Still, you compel us to follow, knowing that this cross is too heavy for us to carry alone. You say, count the cost and consider what discipleship is. Sometimes we squirm and we say that the cost is too great and the sacrifice is too numerous. Still, you compel us to follow. The cross you ask us to bear carry is not nearly as heavy as the cross you carried for us. Today we ask a special prayer for those who have been lifted to you this morning. Let them feel you, your love, and our love. Grant healing to those recovering from illness and surgery. Grant peace to those grieving. 
And to those who have high anxiety, Lord, also your peace. Grant joy to those who are depressed. In your mercy, mercy, sovereign Lord, fulfill our every need. We also lift up those in the labor movement in this country who have paved the way to many things that we take for granted. Safety in the workplace, the abolition of child labor, the 40-hour work week ideal that might be laughable for some of us, the weekend. They have helped us to know that work is not what defines us, oh God, nor should it be, even though sometimes it feels like it still is. But you have created us for joyful obedience to you, and we ask that we might understand our work as that which might enable us to live freely and joyfully for you. We pray these things in the name of the one who said to us, come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest as we make a joyful noise to Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Continue our singing on page 616, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. 1, 2, 3, and 5, page 616. Please stand. invite the ushers to come forward for the, our offering time. Let us pray as they are walking. Holy and righteous God, through your Son you have called us to follow. 
The gifts we offer this day are but a small token of affirmation that we accept that call. If we embrace the full meaning of that call, we would give our whole being to the offering. In many cases, we've allowed ourselves to believe that a few dollars in an hour on Sunday is the cost of discipleship. Help us to stop fooling ourselves, O oh God, and consider the full cost of discipleship that means something, that is capable of transforming the world. By your grace and with the help of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost? to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The word of God for the people of God. Be you may be seated. This time we'd like for the children to come down for the children's message. marshmallow for you. There you go. Now, don't eat it yet. <laughs> Please don't eat it. Those are the rules. You cannot eat it. 
Now, why would God, God give us anything, that, like a good gift like this, if God didn't want us to eat it? Why would I give you a good gift if, God didn't, or if, if I wouldn't want you to eat it? You don't have to answer that. Sometimes God asks us to do strange things, right? Sometimes our parents ask us to do strange things, things that we don't understand, right? I have a daughter who is younger than any of you, uh, and when I ask her to do things, she doesn't understand, right? Sometimes I might tell her, no, I don't want you to eat that piece of candy right before dinner, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> Even though it tastes yummy, it might ruin our dinner, right? God asks us to do some strange things, too, sometimes, to abstain from things in this world. Abstain means not to do things that are bad, right? Uh, I always have to dumb down my language, <laughs> no, no matter who I'm talking to. Uh, so uh, abstain means not to do uh, bad things, right? To stop from yourself from doing them. Sometimes we have a hard time doing that, right? But you all, I don't think it's the case sometimes because you still haven't eaten that marshmallow. And I reward you because of that. You can eat it now. <laughs> you don't like marshmallows, huh? All right, that's fair enough. It's fair enough. You know, we'll, we'll figure something out. We will figure something out. Sometimes Jesus asks us to do hard things, but the, the thing is, we can do hard things. We can give up marshmallows for a little while if God asks us to, right? Uh, now, sometimes in life, I'm sorry to tell you, that's not as easy as not eating a marshmallow. Sometimes it gets harder. Sometimes it gets really hard. But the good thing is, you have a family here and people who love you, who are going to try and help you as much as they can to do the hard things together with them. Isn't that great? That's a good thing. Why don't we go to God in prayer and thank God that we have those folks in our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you that even though sometimes you do ask us to do hard things, that you give us helpers, our families, our friends, our church family, to do those hard things that you ask us to do. We thank you for Jesus, who did the hardest thing when he gave himself up for us. We pray all of these things in his name. Amen. Thanks, Chris. At this time, we ask you to stand up, greet your neighbor, tell them, happy Labor Day. God loves you. <laughs>
lives over and over again for about 15 minutes until I shut up. <laughs> Exactly, maybe failure of some kind. They think that the relationship's going to fizzle out, maybe, and they just want to skip that part. The classic example of commitment issues is the runaway bride. It is a literal trope in TV shows, but this one, this particular trope, uh, is fabulous. Uh, the main character, Maggie, uh, and I ha have not admittedly seen this movie, so forgive me if I offer you something that is inaccurate from what I read on Wikipedia. <laughs> but she had left several fiancés at the altar, and all of them were ca caught on video. And so she even ends up leading, or leaving this reporter, Richard Gere, as well. Even though she eventually ma ends up marrying him later. But talk about some serious commitment issues to leave, I don't know how many folks she left at the altar. That's some bad commitment issues. It ends up being that she can't commit to even being herself around her romantic partners. And so they fall in love with a fake version of herself. One that she couldn't commit to being for the rest of her life. In our scripture passage for today, Jesus senses the commitment issues in the crowd that follows him. Did you get that? Did you get that there was a large crowd following Jesus? He could have easily catered to these wannabe disciples. <laughs> he could have made the hit single from the Spice Girls early. Y'all know wannabe from the 1990s. If you want to be my lover, you got to get with my friends. That was good. Thank you. Thank you for the echo there. Was, that really kind of sealed it. Uh, he could have made it easy for folks to follow him, in other words. Getting with your friends is pretty easy. Come on. I mean, instead, he looks at the crowds around him, and he does an, uh, another remix. If you want to be my disciple, you got to hate your family. Not as catchy, is it? Jesus, that doesn't sound like a hit single. <laughs> if he took that one to the record executives of the first century that didn't exist, they probably wouldn't sign him to a record deal. I think there's something going on here that's not immediately obvious until you kind of put this passage into its larger context in Luke. Uh, first of all, this is in the larger context of Jesus going down to Jerusalem. Luke starts this narrative, it's called the travel narrative, in, in chapter 9, verse 51, where he says Jesus turns his face or sets his face toward Jerusalem. And we know what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He goes there to die. And he knows that it probably won't end well for some of his disciples either. And so I, intentionally, I think, he's trying to sabotage, maybe that's not the right word, to thin out the crowds a little bit of these would-be, wannabe disciples. Why did he have such a big crowd following him? Well, I think that had a little bit to do with what immediately precedes these words in Luke chapter 14. The parable that he tells immediately before this passage, which is the parable of the feast, in which those who are invited initially say, nah, I'm good. Thanks for the invite, uh, God, or it's whoever the, 
the person doing the inviting is in this parable. I've got other stuff to do. And so the master sends his servants into the streets to go to any regular Joe, and not really any regular Joe, but those who are on the outskirts of society, those who are lame and blind, and you fill in the adjective. To get those folks to fill up the house completely, the message is that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God are open to everyone. Not just those you thought who would be invited to the party. Maybe not those who were initially invited to the party. And I think that kind of resonates with folks because it's radically different than a program of, uh, well, you have to follow every part of the law and uh, be among the religious elite in order to get to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has a way that is much different than anything that was offered back then and I think anything that's offered now to us. And immediately after telling them that the feast is open to all, Jesus kind of flips this and says how costly it's going to be to follow him. I think there were new folks who had no idea what Jesus was about. who had no idea what sacrificial living was. Jesus didn't have time for that on his way to Jerusalem. He was going there to die, and on his way, he's teaching these folks what it means to be his disciple. So he reminds his closest friends, the 12, what it means to follow him, how costly it is as if they didn't already know. <laughs> they had already given up everything for him when they were called, right? Peter and Andrew tossed the nets away while they're fishing. Jesus calls them to be fishers of people. People catchers. <laughs> that kind of has a different connotation, I guess. I'm read, reminded of the story of the rich man who comes to Jesus, and, and you all know the story where he asks Jesus, I, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life, God, <laughs> Jesus? And Jesus says, well, you've got to keep the commandments. And he's like, yeah, I know that. I've done that all the days of my life. I've followed every commandment. Uh, and he replies, Jesus does, that he has. You're right. You did. And you lack one thing. And the one thing that it is, is the same thing that this passage ends with. Sell all of your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And he wouldn't do it, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. That he had made, I think, his idol. He might not have considered his wealth an idol, but it is literally the thing that he placed above following God in the flesh. He had commitment issues. Time and time again, Jesus reminds us that following him is not easy. It's never been easy. And if it feels easy, then maybe we're doing it wrong. We may not be doing this whole disciple of Jesus Christ thing right. The list of things that Jesus tells us that we might have to give up in order to follow him are just hard. They're daunting, and it cuts to me because I value family. And I know you do, too. I know we all do. If you don't hate your own life, most of us in this country, I think, sometimes have self-esteem problems. And so I want you to hear this if you do have self-esteem problems, that God is not telling you to hate yourself. God is telling you how hard it is to follow Jesus Christ. And our immediate reaction to this is often, well, he can't mean this literally, right? It's the, to hate your own family, he has to mean something else. You know, I, I say and I think that about scripture sometimes myself. But I want you to resist that urge to dull Jesus' words. 
and to sit with them and let them make you feel uncomfortable because they are. Those words are uncomfortable. I think Jesus did mean that literally. You think his mother didn't beg him to stop this foolishness at some points and stop teaching and upsetting these folks around him. I know I've, I've been told by my mother that I need to calm down uh, and, and stop saying all the truth all the time sometimes. If she's watching this, she'll probably agree. Uh, there's something about subtlety, right? Jesus' own family tried to stop him from doing miracles and preaching God's word once. And he replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? My family are those who do God's will. That's not an exact quote, but it's close enough. It's what he said, and it's definitely what he meant. We're talking about a man who would disown his own flesh and blood to fulfill God's mission in this world in order to bring about the kingdom. You don't think he meant this literally? You don't think he demanded something similar of his closest friends, the 12, who left everything behind, everything, to come and follow him? What I'm asking you to do is to resist the urge to tame Jesus and make him palatable for the sake of our relationships with God and each other and for the goodness of our souls. Because the sooner we come to grips with the fact that our Savior demanded some hard things from us, the better it is it's going to be for us, the better off our lives are going to be. I've been reading a, a, a contemplative theologian named Henry Nowen for our residents in ministry group. It's a, it's a group of the first year provisional elders in the United Methodist Church who have just come through and been approved for uh, commissioning as provisional elders in the, in the church. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in a group with six folks. There's another uh, with six folks because there's a married couple and they can't be together in those groups. Uh, and so uh, we've been reading this, this theologian, Henry Nowen, and he was a teacher at, at, at important theological schools like Harvard and Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame uh, who lost last night. That was a good game, by the way. <laughs> My family's in town. There are a bunch of Ohio State Buckeye fans, uh, and so uh, there was much rejoicing this morning. <laughs> we, we didn't make it up, for all of it at least. So he was a, 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 an important teacher, and he gave up his career to go live and be a priest among those with mental disabilities at large communities. Y'all know what large communities are? The communities that are designed especially for folks with mental disabilities so that they can have community in and, 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 and good, meaningful ways. Uh, but talk about a drastic change. I have no doubt that Henry Nowen was making close to six figures even back then. He was an important teacher. And he gave up his teaching career because something was missing. Just as some of us can tell sometimes in our own lives, I don't know if this is true for you, but it's true for me, that there's something missing in our lives as Christian leaders. Sometimes the details of leadership get us bogged down and distracted from the ultimate goal, right? The ultimate goal is to embody God's love, to be physical representation of God's first love for us to others. His answer to this, to getting bogged down and distracted, is contemplative prayer. Who has, uh, and we, you can raise a hand or say yes or no as it might be, who has the time to spend an hour and a half a day in meditative prayer? Anyone? You learn. Noah? <laughs> no, Bueller? Pray without ceasing, Scripture commands us, right? Some of us are lucky to pray at meals. Having a life like Henry Nowen's and making that 
six-figure salary allowed him to step out, I think, to have a lot of time to dedicate to contemplative prayer. But the thing is, he's right. Of course he's right. We should be spending time talking with God and listening to God, right? I mean, that is one of our spiritual disciplines. It's the best way to hear God's voice. There's so many things competing for our attention in this world. And we often get to a space where these things overrule what we know is true, that God's relationship with us in our lives is what is most important. And it requires our constant maintenance and our constant attention and our mindfulness and our full awareness. And if we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, that is what is required of us. Some of us in this world, myself included, who call ourselves Christian, have forgotten some of the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we just, we think it's going to be easy. Y'all, the Savior did this for us. If that's you this morning, if you are in the group of folks like me who sometimes forget of what it means to follow Jesus Christ, let me remind you as I remind myself of the cost. Everything. Picking up your cross daily and following him. And I don't think that means Jesus wants you to die literally. But rather that we are to live lives that are cruciform in nature. That means emptying ourselves of our own will, and following God's will wherever it leads us, living sacrificially for other people, completely, to the point that it may not make sense to you, to the point that it definitely doesn't make sense to your family. And it might take some hard work to do that. It means living lives that are nonsensical to the world because self-sacrifice is so counter to the survival of the fittest and the doggy dog mentality of this world. John Wesley talked about what this life means in this sermon of his called the almost Christian. Some of you, if you've been Methodist for a long time, might have heard this sermon or read it. And in it, he writes that and, and originally preached out loud that we can have every good intention in the world. We can abstain from all evil. We can do all the good that we can do in sincerity, and it will still not make us a Christian. Being an altogether Christian means two things for John Wesley, and I can walk away from my notes because I know them so innately. It's holiness. That's really one thing, but it means two different things. It's the, the pure love of God. The pure love of God with all your heart and mind and soul and being. Like Deuteronomy 6, 4 says in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. And the second one is like it. Y'all remember this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments for Jesus, and that is what holiness means for John Wesley, and that is what it means to be not just an almost Christian, but an altogether Christian. And if you haven't noticed, love makes you do some crazy things. It makes you give up your Saturdays to help move uh, furniture into a, to an apartment of some of our most frequent attendees. Uh, I was sad to miss most of the, the hard labor. I know you may not believe that, but I actually was sad to miss that hard labor yesterday. I wish I could have been there for that, but I, I loved being able to pray with this family and bless their home as they moved into a new apartment from one that was just burnt up. It makes us, love makes us do some, some things that don't make sense to the rest of the world. Love is action. It's not just words. There's a great quote from Fred Rogers, who's one of my favorite theologians. <laughs> you know him as Mr. Rogers. 
he's one of our greatest theologians that's ever lived in America. And if you don't believe that, uh, I, I would love to spend some time convincing you of it. Love, he says, isn't a perfect state of caring. It's an action noun, like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. I love that. And that's what it's supposed to be like to love God and neighbor. Sometimes it actually really is a struggle. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard. Loving God, it, it, it involves us actually engaging in spiritual disciplines like contemplative prayer, like spending time hearing God's word in scripture, like praying and meditating and living sacrificially. Loving God means following God's commandments. Yes, but it also involves doing, doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly. Love of God requires the love of neighbor. Fighting for justice on their behalf and constantly being merciful and graceful toward them. And so that, my friends, is what an altogether Christian is. Are you almost Christian? Are you an altogether Christian? If I'm being honest with myself, I would love to be an altogether Christian more than I am. (laughs) And that's not something you want to hear your pastor say all the time. I think that's what all of us want, though. Aren't we on a journey to sanctification? Aren't we trying to love God and neighbor more than what we do right now? And if you're not trying to do that, can I invite you to do that? Have you professed faith in Christ? Most of us here have. But then forgotten about the cost of what it is to be a disciple? We call this backsliding in the United Methodist Church. A lot of us have backslided at some point in our lives. Have you developed some commitment issues along the way that where you might be consciously or subconsciously thinning out your relationship with God, leaving God at the altar, running away from the true cost of being a disciple. The call, like Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, right before this passage, is for everyone. It's for everyone, 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 everyone. But not everyone will respond. If you have not taken on the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, the invitation is yours. It's hard. Most of us in here can say it is hard, but it is so very, very worth it. It should be hard. But we can do hard things together as a church and with God, and we don't have to do it alone. Christ doesn't demand anything of us that he hasn't done himself. Would you profess your faith in him today? Would you count the cost first? Uh, Please hear this testimony. I have seen the cost, and I've felt the cost, and it has cost me some relationships with my family. It's cost me some of my friendships. It's cost me a job that I loved. But there's been more joy in this job. There's been more love in this job. There's been more of a sense of God's calling in my life. So there is a cost. But I think almost every single person in this room would tell you that, yes, there's a cost, but the cost is worth it. It's worth every bit of the cost. Because our Lord is merciful and gracious and kind and a relationship with him is worth every little bit of the hard things that he has demanded from us. I don't do this often. I don't do an altar call very often. But I think today it's especially appropriate because we're talking about discipleship. And so would you respond to God's call toward true discipleship this morning by professing publicly, I believe in Jesus Christ, 
and I want everyone to know. And I want him to make him Lord of my life and to follow him the rest of my days. And so the invitation is yours. It's always open because God is always open and he will never, ever leave you or forsake you. This is the gospel, y'all. And our kneeling rails are always open. My office is always open. If you'd like to hear more about what discipleship costs, the invitation is yours. I make home visits too. <laughs> Let's talk about how this journey is going because most of us have professed faith in Jesus Christ already here. But let's talk about the journey together. Let's talk about how we can support each other more on this journey, this hard journey, and to continue it together with God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our closing hymn is on page 424, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? Page 424, please stand. invitation is still open. We're not going to have five more minutes of altar call, don't worry. But I want you to know that my office is open, that I am here for you, and I will do whatever it takes to make your relationship with Jesus Christ better. Hear now these words of benediction. Go into the world and live into that high cost. It's not going to be easy, but together we can do the hard things. And so go and do the hard things in the name of Jesus Christ. Go in peace to love and serve. Amen.
Bad. Bad. 